Welcome back. Well, I have a new coffee cup this morning. Uh, it's so and a fan and a fantastic. Imagine that. Look at that. Ah. And that came in the same box as this. This is the item that I bought. This is uh, a muffin ear. Um, and I thought this would look very nice on the stove. I got this from Jeffrey over at Real Nifty Vintage. I had seen this and I favorited this. I think I put a little heart next to it said, oh, I like that little Art Deco muffin ear. And then Etsy sent me a note and said, gee, you put it on sale. And I was like, oh, well, jump, jump. So I got this. This is what I bought. And this is what I got along with it. Very nice little gift. And if it turns out that this does not grab me after all, and I'm going to live with it for a while because the stuff having anything to do with my stove usually takes me a while to make up my mind about. But if it doesn't, I'm going to be able to put it in my own Etsy shop and make my money back on it. And why is that? That is because Jeffrey sells at good prices. So whenever I find an Etsy or eBay seller that sells at good enough prices to let me experiment like this, knowing that I can take the item I bought from them, put it right back online and sell it and make my money back, oh, believe me, they go on my favorites list. So, real nifty vintage Etsy. Check it out. And we are going to get to our project when we come back. I have rather carefully moved my cup out of the way and I don't know if you can see but it's got coffee in it so I got to be careful because I can be a real slob and today is project day well here is the shade here's the upper portion I did not get as much of the rust off as I would have liked but I got a lot of it off and it's much cleaner than it started off. So, I'm a little disappointed, but not overwhelmingly so. Because whenever you're working with older pieces, you clean them as best you can. And what you end up with is what you end up with. Uh, one of the biggest challenges on this is... Uh, this is a parchment shade, and the problem is I don't know if this is real parchment. Real parchment is animal hide. I don't know if this is real parchment or some sort of, like, polymer that appears to be parchmenty. You have to remember that back in the mid-century, and we're talking, I mean, you saw this lampshade. It was, you know, real 1950s. That was the era of better living through chemistry. Now, of course, my generation, those of us who came of age in the 60s, put a totally different spin on that. Oh, we were so bad. But in the 50s, they made everything out of plastic. Is this real animal hide? Is this some sort of plastic compound? Is it something else entirely? I don't know. I know it's called parchment because it looks and feels like parchment. The real test, and I'm not going to do this, but the real test is literally to taste it because if this is an animal product, you can taste that. So I'm not going to lick Jocelyn's shade. I'm tempted, but I'm not going to do it. But in the absence of absolute certainty about a material, when you're dealing with older things, you really have to default to the cautious path. The reason is, if this is an animal hide, there are all kinds of things you can do to it. You know, it, 
yeah, you could scrub the daylights out of it with a brush, etc. Because it's it's like scrubbing your own skin, you know. Yeah, it might turn red, but you know, it's not going to peel off if you scrub it. When you don't know what an item is made of, you just have to take the cautious road. You can't get crazy and say, oh, well, I'm going to start scrubbing. What if this is some sort of plastic coating on paper? Did they use paper for shades in the 50s? You bet they did. Um, like regular, well, I want to say it's just like notebook paper, but it wasn't quite that bad. They did, in fact, use rice paper. Uh, they used heavier papers that were made a lot like rice papers. They did um, cold press papers, all kinds of paper shades. They had these parchment type things. They had shades made out of mica, which is um, a mineral. They had shades made out of fiberglass, which is, of course, a, a spun glass product. So what is this made of? I have no idea. I know only that it's called parchment. So consequently, path of, of least um, destructiveness is what we did. And now what I'm going to do, uh, let me turn this upside down. Ah, first thing I want to do, I should probably tell you why I'm turning it upside down, is I want the bottom edge of the shade, remember this was the lower half, this is the upper half, and I took it apart starting with the upper half and working my way down. So now I'm going to reverse the process. So I want this lower half to be the part I'm working on. That's why I have to turn it upside down. And I was trying to determine which was the lower half. And the way I can tell is the rust was a little more prominent on the upper side of the lower half. So this is our ring. This is the ring that goes around the bottom of the lower half of the shade. So I'm just going to drop this right in here and just pull it up because I need it on the inside. And I've got these, uh, these are clips, the kind of clips you put on chip bags or something like that, bread bags to hold them. And that's all I'm doing. I've got two clips holding this ring in place. And there are so many other ways you can do this. You can use binder clips. You can actually do what Jocelyn did when she secured the shade. And you can get little twist ties and just run it through the rings. But I feel I don't need more than two clips, so that's what I'm doing. Now, this is the GIMP that I'm using to redo the shade. Now, it's this was like... I don't know. Apparently, this is like 30 yards of GIMP. And this is how it came. So I am just going to snip this. Set this aside. Because however much I need, I do not need, you know, more than 10 continuous yards. So now we've got the... Uh, the twist ties, and no, I'm not saving them for Jocelyn. Next time she has a broken shade, she's just going to have to give it to me. Just be a big girl, suck it up, and let me have that shade so we can have a project and she can have a shade. So now I'm going to try to sort of tease this apart without making too much of a mess. Um, So I'm guessing that we're going to be needing at least twice the circumference. So I'm just going to wrap it around twice, and when we get there, I'm going to cut that off. And that's 
that's our leftovers now, and this should do it. This is the piece we're working with. Now, why wouldn't I work with that much? Because I need to thread this through the little holes. Can you see the little holes here? I need to thread it through the holes around this ring. And I need to keep it smooth. What The only real trick to doing this is you don't want your gimp to get twisted. You want it smooth and flat. Now, usually you can tell with your fingers which is the top side and which is the bottom side. One side will usually have a little bit of a, a curve to it. Uh, is it necessary? No, not at all. I'm going to start um, right over here. This is where our seam is. Let me show you the seam right there where my fingers are. That's our seam running across. So that's where I'm going to start. And I am, in fact, I'm going to start working over here. So I'm going to tie it off on the other, on the other side of that seam. And all I'm going to do with this is just loop it through one of the holes around the ring and then just tie it off. No big deal. This is not fancy. All it's doing is holding my gimp in place. And when I come back around, I will untie that. That's why I'm not tying this too tightly. I'll tie it tightly enough to make sure it holds. But that's about it. It's just holding it in place. Now, you notice I'm pulling it through my thumb and my forefinger to keep it straight. Remember I said that was the big issue. You want to keep this thing from being twisted. So now when I go in here, I'm going to follow the lines. And you will notice there are little lines, little indentations in the shade. When I cleaned it, I tried to get most of them out. But do you see the way the little rust marks are going at an angle? That's the way the old gimp rested on the shade. And we want to follow that pattern. The reason we want to follow that pattern is because this will help to hide the rust. If I had, in fact, chosen to do this with dark brown gimp, as I had thought, it would probably have hidden the rust better. It would make the shade less versatile, but it would have, been, uh, would have done a better job of hiding the rust. So, you know, give with one hand, take with the other. I'm going for versatility. So my lines are going this way. So I'm going to just pop this through. And once I've determined that, that makes everything very, very easy. We're going right through. And then it will go, it will lay right across here. And I know because it's not brightly colored, it's hard to see. But then we just go in with the next one, right through the next hole. And where are you, hole? There we go. And now we caught our first one. And we're just going back for the next one and on and on. So it's remarkably easy, you know, when you consider all you're doing is just threading GIMP through a hole. The only part, here I just, here I just did that, okay. The only part that is a problem is you have to make sure that your shade is on the outside of your ring, that it's not slipping, that the ring isn't 
that the ring isn't coming out like this and maybe the shade going behind like that. You need to make sure it stays, you know, just like that. And of course, that was why I put those clips on it to keep it there. And then I just took it off so I could show you what it was like. All right. So you've seen the first couple. I'm going to pause for a moment because you don't need to watch me go through this. I'm going to pause for a moment, lay some more up, and show you what, what we do when we get to the end. Okay? So, just going to pause. We'll be back in a second. Okay, now I'm coming to the end. And now what I'm going to do, not quite done yet, I'm going to go through this and make sure that everything is straight, that there are no twists in my gimp, that everything is laying tight and flat. I don't want it too tight. I don't want it so tight that I'm stretching the gimp, but I want it tight enough so that it's going to hold and that the ring that, and now remember, I'm, I'm lacing the shade to the ring. The ring is the support of the shade. I need to make sure it's tight enough so that it stays put. The fabric, whatever it is, in this case parchment, that the fabric is staying tight against the ring. Now, oh, and we did. Look at that. We got a little twist in there. So, we just untwist and keep going. Now, I'm going to put one of my clips back on so I can hold this in place while I lace up the last couple of holes. And once we are through with the last couple of holes, we're going to tie it off. Now, if you'll recall, I left myself plenty of room to tie it off. Uh, now we're here at that last hole, and remember I started it on the other side of the seam. And that's because I wanted to be able to tie it off there. So, now that we've got this, we're going to go right through there. And that is our last hole. Now, everything is lying flat. There are no twists. And I have my two ends. So now I'm simply going to take my two ends and tie them together in just a standard knot. I believe they call that a square knot. It's just tie-tie, exactly the way you would tie it if you were five years old. And I'm going to cut it loose for now. I'm, I'll come in later and cut these ties off. But for now, I've got plenty of uh, tails on this little knot. So that's our bottom. Now, as you can see, when it's done, you're really not going to be able to see much of the gimp that I used. It's just going to blend right back into the shade. I have another lampshade I did in this color, uh, and it's a parchment colored shade, but it's fiberglass, not parchment. I'll show you a picture of that so that you can see what it looks like, not only like this, you know, when it's, it's not lit from behind, but because that one is on a lamp, I'll be able to turn the lamp on and show you what it looks like when it's lit from behind too. So there's the bottom of our shade.
This is the ring that goes to the top. Now here. Now I'm going to try to hold that so you can see. Do you notice that this ring, the outer ring, is higher than the inner ring? See the way these little connecting bars are bent down? And that is so this will rest a little below the top and you won't see gaps in between. So this is going to just sit in here. I'm going to do the same thing I did before uh, with my little clips. And now at this point, because the shade is fixed to the bottom ring, it's pretty stiff and it's kind of holding its own pretty well. But I think at this point you can see that if you have these pieces, you can pretty much wire just about anything onto a shade. Uh, if you had a, a piece of paper, you could just do the same thing. Um, I frankly think that some of those artisan papers, you know, where they put like, like little flower petals in the papers and so on, would make for great shades like this. And I wish I could find somebody who sells them. So, now we're going to do the same thing here that we did on the lower level. Just going to lace it through. Now here's the thing. I'm going to tell you this and you're going to go online and you are going to see fiberglass lampshades and you're going to say, Sue, that's not how it's done. Yeah, it is. Notice the direction the lacings are going in. And these are going from, um, well, on your side, what is it? It's the lower, lower left to upper right, I think. That's how it's going. All of your lacings should go in the same direction. When you see them done differently, it's because those are modern reproduction shades where they'll have the lacings going you know, right to left on the bottom, and then on the middle, they'll be going left to right, and then on the top, they'll be going right to left. No, that's not how it was done. Um, modern lampshade makers might find that attractive and artistic, but that was definitely not the thing back in the 50s. That's just not how they did it. All of your lacings go in the same direction. Just that simple. So when we start doing this, we are going to make sure that is exactly how we do it. I'm going to pull this through, tie it over here. And then we're just going to start beating it through the same way because this is what we're looking for. We are not looking for our lacing to make an artistic statement. Um, this was the 1950s. They did not allow the lacings to make artistic statements. Um, they were, they took those things very seriously and lacings were expected to know their place. So this one is a little more difficult to lace because I have to go around all of these all of these little bars but it's not overwhelmingly difficult um, it's just a question of getting the, the the little piece of lacing through our little hole 
um, we need to keep our ring in place. Oh, and you can, I'm going to show you one of the things I do. Um, this, you don't have to pull the lacing all the way through every time you poke it through a hole. You can go through two or three holes at a time, is what I'm doing now, and then just pull it all. And then just go back, feel it, make sure it's all where it's supposed to be. And then you can just keep going like that. Again, very easy, very simple. I'm going to pause you again while I stop and do this. And then we're going to come back for that section. Okay, so we have our shade done. And can you see our little tails here? Um, we'll come in later and clip those off. Uh, why am I leaving long tails? I probably should let you know this. I always do this. It's just in case anything has gone wrong. And when I go through on my final check, if I need to, um, you know, to uh, retwist the, uh, the gimp, if I need to, uh, if I need to straighten things out, I like having a little extra to work with because I will check this again before I cut these. So that's just sort of my better safe than sorry. I'm happier if I can add, you know, the little tails. Now, this is our upper section and it's going to go on like this. Oh, I'm sorry. It's out of camera range. Like this. Now, when I start to do this, I want to make sure this is lined up properly. We're going to want the seams in the back, and we will want this little, this is called a clip-on shade, so this is how it clips on. This goes over the light bulb. We're going to want this in the back next to that shade, or next to that seam, rather. Sorry. Um, and the reason we want it there is because now it lines up properly. This is the exact back of the shade, and our little bulb is being held properly. So we're going to clip this in place. I cut off another length of gimp. And both of these uh, uh, stitching lines are going in the same direction. We want the same on this as well. Now, when we started, I said I was doing this in the reverse order that, you know, we took it apart. But at this point, we're not really, because I started taking the top apart, and then I separated the pieces. Actually, the reason we did that, if you'll recall, is because the top was coming apart already. When we, when we do this, um, if we hadn't dealt with something that was already coming apart, the first thing we would have done would be to separate the two pieces, the top from the bottom. We did that backwards when we took this apart out of necessity. So we just need to keep that in mind that now that we have the luxury of doing things the way we should, we're going to finish that top edge and then we're going to put them back together. So, let's take a look and see which way they are going. Okay. So, I'm tying my gimp off. Same way I started before. In, here's our seam, and I'm doing it in the hole just past our seam because we're working in this direction. So, now we're just going to go through the holes again, exactly the same way we did it on the bottom. Okay. 
except this is smaller now, so it's a little easier to hold it in our hand and do it because you can very easily hold this little shade in one hand and keep it straight. So once again, we're just going through, looping the gimp through the hole and around the rod. What we are doing is we're using the gimp to tie the shade to our ring. I just called that a rod. It's a ring. You see? And you notice it's in the same direction as the lower part of the shade because that's how they did it in the 50s. And then we're just going to come around and we're going to finish doing the top. And once again, I'm going to pause. I'm going to spare you the, the ordeal of just watching me lace, lace, lace. All right, and then we'll come back when we put it together. Okay. This is our shade now. And this is going to go on Jocelyn's little lamp. Right now, it's on a brown lamp. But obviously, she can put this on any color sh uh, lamp she chooses. She's got a very neutral shade here, and the GIMP is also very neutral. It'll go with anything. Um, and under some circumstances, you might want to customize your shade to the lamp. But, and this is Jocelyn, this is the crazy lamp lady. It's not like this is this shade is going to stay on that lamp forever. There is no doubt in my mind that this shade is going to move on to another lamp, that the lamp that this is on right now will get a different shade. It all depends on what she happens to find. And believe me, if she finds, you know, this wonderful splashy atomic print on a beige shade with some, you know, brown uh, print on it, you know that this one's going to go somewhere else. So this is how we do a shade. It's just these shades were very common in the 50s. This is very similar to the way one would do a modern shade. We're no longer lacing them like this. That is very definitely a, a mid-century thing. Nowadays, what would happen is we would probably wrap a piece of uh, um, uh, bias tape or uh, trim across the edge and secure one end of the trim to our shade fabric and the other end we would secure behind with our little ring in between. When we start the project of making our own shade, we'll definitely look at that and see how we're going to work that. Meantime, this is how to repair a 1950s shade. See, there was really nothing to it. So we managed to take it apart, clean it, restring it, and we're just going to pop this right back on Jocelyn's lamp. Now, before we go, I do want to show you a picture of a lamp. Uh, and as I say, it's a different lamp. It has this kind of trim on it, and it's a fiberglass shade. But I want you to see what this trim looks like when the light is turned on or when the light is turned off. And, you know, so you can see actually, you know, the way it's supposed to look. Uh, because we don't have a little lamp here to stick this on. All right, so that'll come up before we go. Meantime, have a great day. I will see you all tomorrow. Remember, real nifty vintage. Go check out Jeffrey's shop. Um, he's got really, really interesting stuff and very good prices, so give it a look. So, see you tomorrow. 
Take care. Stay safe. Stay sane. We'll be here.